So thank you everyone for coming out tonight. My name is Lissa Weinman. I'm one of the partners here at 118 Elliott. And um, we're so happy that you've come out. Um, thank you also to everyone's books who's been partnering with 118 Elliott on the Climate Emergency Book Series. Um, we started with three books. This is the second in the series. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that we can continue to um, feature some of the new books about climate that are coming out really every day um, in the year ahead. So stay tuned. And thanks also to Epsilon Spires, um, who's partnering with us on tonight's event. Thank you, Epsilon Spires. Um, uh, the next event will feature the first novel of uh, our local hero, Chuck Collins, Altar to an Erupting Sun. He's with us tonight, and maybe he'll tell us when people can get the book so that maybe they can read it before your talk, and maybe? Mm -hmm. and yeah. Is uh, that possible? It's actually out two days before the event, so unless you're really <laughs> okay. a speed reader. But it, yeah, it comes out on March 9th, so this is the May. event being May 9th. <clears throat> so this will be the first in-person event. So oh. Yay. May 11th. Chuck's written many other books um, as well um, on income inequality in the United States, and I consider him the preeminent expert of that here. So thank you, Chuck, for all your hard work for many, many years on that most important subject. Um, we're going to um, start the event, and I'll do a brief bio, um, but we will be having a book signing afterward, and John will speak for about a half an hour and then take a half an hour of questions. Um, and he's going to repeat your questions. We're not going to hand the microphone around. Um, so if you ask a question, he'll repeat it. Um, and let me see, is there any other? No, that's about it. So let me get started and introduce. I'm so excited to have John Erickson with us tonight. Um, he was here a few years ago to explain the Green New Deal to us as part of a climate event we did back in, um, I think it was 2019. Um, and I was so impressed with him. I, I was just thrilled to hear about his new book and have him join us again. Um, John is the professor of sustainability science and policy at the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources at the University of Vermont in Burlington. He's also a fellow of the Gund Institute for Environment. Um, he completed his PhD in natural resource economics at Cornell University in 1997. Um, before joining the University of Vermont in 2002, he was an assistant professor at the Economics Department at Rensselaer Polytechnic mm -hmm. Institute in Troy, New York, where he helped found the world's first PhD program in ecological economics in the halls of America's uh, oldest engineering college. Um, his research contributed, contributes to ecological, economic theory, and applied work on human health, sustainable development, land and biodiversity conservation, watershed planning, forest management, climate change economics, and renewable energy. Um, he's written six books published more than 70 peer-reviewed journal articles. Um, he's an adjunct professor at the University of Iceland. He was a Fulbright Scholar um, in Tanzania, and he's been a visiting professor in the Dominican Republic and in Slovakia. He's past president of the U.S. Society for Ecological Economics and the Adirondack Research Consortium. Um, and many has sat on many other um, different nonprofits. It's, he's also a, a social entrepreneur and has started a number of nonprofits and non working in the science to policy interface. He founded Bright Blue Echo Media and produced a uh, New England Emmy Award winning series on river and lake eutrophication and pollution around America. Um, his latest film was called Waking the Sleeping Giant which he made with Jacob Smith, and I think it was 2018, 2018, which um, was uh, an award-winning feature-length documentary on the 2016 presidential campaign of our own Bernie Sanders. 
Um, he also helped develop the genuine progress indicator um, here in Vermont, which led to a 2012 law to initiate the use of GPI in state policy and budget analysis. Um, his full bio is at the front desk. Um, the audio book is uh, available as of today for Progress Illusion. And um, we'll be doing the signing afterward. And I'm just so pleased to have him here. Please welcome John Erickson. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me down to Brattleboro again, and uh, it's always such a pleasure to come down south. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is uh, this is like a midlife crisis book, right? It's like a reflection of 30 years of a career as an economist. Uh, it's a book about economics, so I'm really surprised that there's this many people out. <laughs> this is not, not a theme usually that brings out crowds, but 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 maybe this is a different. I hope I set out to do a different kind of book about economics. Um, it's about my relationship with this body of knowledge, this discipline that we call economics. I'd love to learn first, like, what's your relationship with economics? Think about that for 20 seconds. Not economy, economics. What is, what's your relationship with economics? And maybe a few of you can share that as we get started. Anyone want to share in a sentence or so? What's your relationship? I got a C in, 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 in college. A C in <laughs> economics in college. Okay. Fantastic. I was going to say balancing my checkbook. Balancing your checkbook. I love it. I love it. Home economics, right? The lost art of home economics. I didn't even take it in college. You didn't take it in college. Okay. So, so your mind was, I, not, I was not warped like myself and this gentleman I got a C. So that's great. There's something that seems important that I don't understand, and it has huge impact. <laughs> that sounds like day one in my classes, right? Okay. So the University of Vermont students like, I think economics is important. I had some in high school. I really don't understand it. Help me out here. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, so this, this book is, uh, is, is about my, myself coming to terms with economics and really sort of thinking through the worldview of economics. Like, look, economists as, as plumbers, as janitors, as mechanics of the economy, I'm, I'm good with that, right? We need, we need that skill set. We need people to tinker and toy and make the economy work for us. But economists as sort of master social planners, lords of the universe. That's, that's where I increasingly through my career <laughs> grew quite uncomfortable. So I, I, I take on this idea of the progress illusion takes on economics as a worldview, if you will. And I think that's where I get a lot of discomfort with my students as well of economics as a worldview. Who remembers Margaret Thatcher? <laughs> The, the UK counterpart to Ronald Reagan. So um, I discovered this quote from her in, in research for this book. She said that economics are the method. The object is to change the heart and soul. Economics are the method. The object is to change the heart and soul. So, so what is this version, this, this, this sort of shadow of economics that really I grew up with? I was, I was born in 1969. And we, we think about um, this era of economic thinking from the mid 70s to the present day as the neoliberal turn, right? Where economics and kind of this ideology, this political ideology of neoliberalism kind of were joined at the hip. And so some of this book is an, an exploration of that. So if I was born in 69, that means I graduated from high school in 87 which I call in this book, The Year of the Gecko. Yeah. Because that was the year of the Michael Douglas Wall Street film oh, and this famous greed is good speech, yeah. which impaled my brain, right? <laughs> and it was like, young man, 17 years old, graduated from high school, going to my dad, I, I was a ski bum. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to go to school and ski. I wanted to be a ski racer. I wanted to make the Olympic team. That was like my whole 
orientation. So I was to my father, what should I study in college? Well, I trained to, <laughs> to be a ski racer. And he said, you know, he came from a business economics background. He was like, well, study business, study economics. You'll, you'll get a job, you'll make money. Greed is good. Greed is good, right? This sort of ideology that it's okay to be greedy because it's what's best for you. And that happens to be what's best for society. And I always had a lot of, I don't know, discomfort with that notion. I grew up Roman Catholic, so maybe there was some sort of underlying guilt there of greed is good. Um, I grew up in a single parent household. My, my mom raised me to sort of love the outdoors, be in place, be in communion with, with, with others, um, to, to love and care for the most vulnerable in society. And this sort of adage of, you know, if you just work hard, everything will work out. Never really seemed to ring true in my own life experience with my mother as a Head Start teacher. But this greed is good speech. And what, I can remember one of the first books out of high school that I read was uh, uh, Mike, Michael Lewis's Liar's Poker, which is this sort of expose of greed is good and the culture of Wall Street, right? Mm -hmm young man filled with testosterone. I was like, yeah, Wall Street, money, fame, fortune. This looks like fun, right? I'll go to school, study economics, study finance, someday get my MBA and go to Wall Street. And I wasn't the only one, my whole generation, <laughs> especially in, I, I, so I was at Cornell University. The Ivy League was this sort of, sort of university to Wall Street pipeline. And I start this book, I lost my little cover here. Sorry for the bad sound. There we go. Um, with the exploration of that, the sort of advice of my father to study economics, but the uneasy sense for my mother to lead with love and care and compassion. Um, my classes in, at Cornell that I took in economics and then I wandered across campus and took an evolutionary biology class and my mind was just like, Phew. both with my Roman Catholic upbringing, it was like, boom, <laughs> and with my study of economics, right? And this sort of characterization of this isolated individual at a point in time that I was learning in my economics classes and this unbelievable interdependence of the human species with the rest of life, right? not isolated at all, but interdependent with the very air we breathe, right? In economics, the caricature of the human is what Thorsten Veblen in 1898 called a homogeneous globule of desire, <laughs> right? Perfect characterization of this rational, isolated, usually a man in most models, person, right? At a point in time. And so, my mother, evolutionary biology. I was always a big fan of reading history. We didn't learn history in economics. Why do I study history when the economic system as it's taught now is perfected in this kind of market-based ideology, right? But coming to terms with history and the waxes and wanes of society and the sort of different flavors and versions of economics and the fact that economics is always and everywhere an expression of a society's values. Right? It's not just this sort of passive, natural thing. And when I was studying economics in the late 80s, early 90s, this phenomenon of economic, economic naturalism became really popular. And the idea of Freakonomics, right? And the armchair economists. And we can describe the whole world through the lens of economics. So, I discovered a, a different path, thankfully, <laughs> so, as most of my colleagues at Cordell were getting their MBAs, <coughs> studying finance, going off to Wall Street. Um, I stumbled into an economist who was trying to merge the study of the environment with economics, a natural resource economist. And he offered for me to stay and do my master's. And I realized that you can get paid to go to school, which I had no idea. <laughs> so I kept studying economics, but started to veer more towards my environmental interests. Um, and I discovered one day in a free book pile, a book by Herman Daly, uh, who is the sort of modern father of this field that I was drawn to called ecological economics. And Herman passed away this past October. 
was a huge influence on my career and the field of ecological economics. And in the title of the book, it was a collection of essays, and in the title of the book were the words economics, ecology, and ethics. And I was like, yeah, I took a class, a required class in ethics over in that part of campus. I took an ecology class over in this part of campus. It's like one of my science electives. And I took all this economics classes. And these worlds and these disciplines and these fields and these traditions were studying, all studying the same world, but speaking a completely different language with a different worldview, with a different perspective. And here I had found a person that had tried to bring these things together, economics, ecology, in ethics. And this was the sort of first step in this long journey that I went on to declaring myself not as an economist, but as an ecological economist, as someone who sort of studies the economy as an ecosystem, mm -hmm. as someone who thinks of the economic system as a physical system embedded in a social system, embedded in an environmental system. Right, and all the interdependencies that, that that implies. Not a system designed by humans with its own set of rules divorced from biophysical reality. And I like that. I like that idea of a, a, a more science-based version of the study of the economy. But also a version of the study of the economy that wasn't values blind, right? That actually recognized that all economies and all economics are an expression of values. Then economy is designed, right, by us, <laughs> not by some sort of natural accident, but an economy is designed by us. Um, and if you think of an economy as an ecosystem, ecosystems go through stages. And in the kind of, if you think of ecological succession here in Vermont, right, our northern hardwood forest, for example, or farm field su succession that eventually results in a mature forest, forest in Vermont. Um, early stage of an ecosystem, you prioritize growth. <laughs> you prioritize light-loving, fast-growing, exploiting species. You prioritize winner-takes-all, right? And so in some, some ways it made sense to sort of build an economics that prioritized growth, prioritized greed, prioritized exploitation, colonialism, all the expression of economics that came out of the 1800s and early 1900s and the kind of economics we teach today is based on that kind of ideology. But as the system matures, as it gets into a late successional stage, shouldn't we trade competition for cooperation? Shouldn't we trade growth for resilience? Right? Shouldn't we trade winner takes all to sharing, comparing, for sharing and comparing, yeah, caring and compassion? So I saw in ecological economics a kind of logical succession into a new kind of economics, an economy that was fit for the 21st century, not for the 18th century, a kind of economics that was interdisciplinary, a kind of economics that was not isolated, a kind of economics that was more human, right, and treated the whole expression of the human animal and all our interrelationships and interdependencies, not the human as a homogeneous globule of desire, right? So that all the mathematics works out to fall into equilibrium and ta-da, economics as it's taught today, especially in our elite graduate programs, is more or less a branch of mathematics. And I ran from that. Um, Carl Polanyi, writing a book called The Great Transformation, while on sabbatical in Bennington, just over the hill, <laughs> from here, um, warned in the 40s and 50s of the coming of a market society, right? A society where the market runs the game, where the market supersedes democracy, where market fundamentalism, right? He sort of foresaw the neoliberal turn became the way that we sort of value and allocate and manage our affairs, right? He saw the coming of what my colleague Richard Norgard calls now the, the econocene. You've probably heard of the Anthropocene, mm -hmm. right? Geologists are sort of saying we're in a new epoch right now, right? 
It's a human dominated epoch and we have to come to terms with this human dominations of, of the planet. Well, there's a subcultural epoch, especially in Western countries that you might call the econocene. And it's based on the idea of economism, right? And economism is the reduction of all social and ecological relationships to market logic. That's the piece that we need to turn on its head and to turn around, to sort of flip things around, a society that runs the market, an economy that works for us, not the other way around. So this ecological economics I, I find is, is roots for a new economy. It's based on love, care, and stewardship, not on extraction, exploitation, and dominion. Um, it's sort of taking back the neoliberal turn this era of the economocene defined by econ economism. And it's taking on what I call the illusions or the fairy tale of economics. So the subtitle of this book is Reclaiming Our Future from the Fairy Tale of Economics. So let's walk through those fairy tales real quick, talk about how to reclaim our future, and then have some discussion. Hopefully I'll have planted enough seeds by then. Let's take on four illusions. First, there's the illusion of history, which I've already referred to, right? In economics, most elite economics programs, you're not taught economic history. You're just not. You're, you're taught this market model. You're taught this branch of mathematics. You're taught that the market system is what we study. You answer the question how to allocate scarce resources to meet desirable ends, but you don't talk about the ends. You don't talk about the scarce resources. You just talk about the allocation. What kind of allocation? Market allocation. Very, very, very narrow perspective on a really important question. So when we unearth the illusion of history, we realize that the orthodoxy of economics, there's this heterodoxy all around it. There's feminist economics and social economics and biophysical economics and ecological economics. There's, there's Marxian economics and there is Schumpeterian economics. There's so many different flavors of economics that the student like myself in the 80s, 90s, and even today aren't taught, aren't told, aren't debated, right? Yet economics is the kind of human defined system we should be leaning into values pluralism. We should be thinking about all the expression of the economic system since it's an expression of a society's values. Uh, Joan Robinson, who was uh, in, one of the more famous students from John Maynard Keynes, she wrote that the purpose of studying economics is not to acquire a set of ready-made answers to economic questions, but to learn how to avoid being deceived by economists. <laughs> I love that quote. <laughs> and, and most of my graduate students come, come to work with me to learn how to be <laughs> to, to learn how to avoid being deceived by economists. And I think um, it's, easy, it's easy to learn that by just studying history, right? And realizing that this particular expression of economics that is taught in our elite economics programs is done so at the bequest, at the funding, <laughs> at the investment of an elite wealthy class, mm -hmm. right? Um, when you really unpack, particularly the kind of current era of the orthodoxy of economics and build a bridge between economics and political ideology, you realize that all through the 70s, all through the 80s, all through up till now, the kind of economics that we taught that preaches selfishness, that preaches individualism, that preaches greed, that preaches winner takes all, that preaches don't share, don't care, don't, <laughs> don't, don't think about the future, um, is, was invested in deliberately, right? Um, I went through reams of studies that sort of connected the dots between how the University of Chicago became the powerhouse in economics, how Harvard became the powerhouse in economics, the merger of economics and the study of law, the merger of economics and political science, the merger of economics and sociology, psychology. These were all done through big, wealthy donors, investments in centers, in research, in education, in curriculum, in textbooks, and it was done as deliberately 
as part of a conservative movement in economics from the 1970s forward to turn back the New Deal, to turn back the Great Society, to unleash the power of the individual under this idea of market freedom, market liberalization. Right. And so there's a whole lot of undoing to be done uh, in these programs. And in my own education is a reflection of that. There's the illusion of the individual. So I've, always, I've already referred to this idea of an isolated individual at a point in time, which is what the economic models are built on. So climate change, I'm supposed to talk about climate change. There's a lot of climate change in this book. Climate economists build their models of the world on a representative individual. One person, one person who is greedy, who wants more utility, right? Who wants more stuff. And that one greedy person in the models of climate economists doesn't want to give up stuff in order to pay for climate mitigation, in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, in order to reduce production, reduce GDP. That's seen as the trade-off. More for me now, or cost now and benefits later. <laughs> so the whole orientation of climate economics is built on this idea of an isolated individual at a point in time. Okay, you, a utility maximizer to use the, the, lingu the language of economics. If we take on what I call the consilience challenge, Ed Wilson, a Harvard biologist who also recently passed away, wrote a beautiful book in 1998 called Consilience with the subtitle The Unity of Knowledge. And he challenged our academic disciplines to a jumping together of knowledge, right? And that the ultimate test of truth in your discipline should be, does it hold up against <laughs> facts and figures and debates in other disciplines? And when you do that for the study of economics, it turns out that economics is one of the most isolated disciplines <laughs> at the university, right? And doesn't hold up against a test of, is it consistent with, oh, physics? First and second law of thermodynamics? Nope. <laughs> is it consistent with what we know about the human animal and thought and how we actually make decisions versus how we wish we made decisions? Nope. Strike, 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 strike. Is it consistent with sociology, anthropology? Is it consistent with earth science? No, 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 no. It's the most non consilient thought system that we have. And so part of this work is to kind of put Humpty Dumpty back together again, right? And do it through what Wilson calls exploring the borderland disciplines, right? The connection of understanding who the person is in our, in our economic models requires us to be consilient with modern neurobiology, modern neuroscience, modern behavioral science, right? To understand what the economic institution is it requires us to be consilient with sociology, anthropology, deep time perspectives of the human animal and human societies, right? And ultimately to understand the individual as embedded in community, as embedded in family, as embedded in environment requires a more consilient approach that we just haven't had in economics. There's no individual anymore in the sciences. Everything is in relationship. There's no isolated individual in biology, in evolutionary biology. Everything is in relationship. What defines an individual is your relationships, not your isolation. And that's a key insight for a, a, a building a new economics. There's the illusion of choice. So the comfort zone for economists like me is at the margin, the incremental choice, the next choice, right? This is the decision rule that we're taught in graduate school, okay? Came out of Cornell with a PhD and all I learned was marginal benefit equals marginal cost. <laughs> That's the decision rule. If the next benefit of, a, of an action has more benefits than costs of that action, then you do it. Right up to the point where they exactly equal one another and then you stop, okay? So, the marginal choice, the next house, the next road, the next parking lot, the next automobile, the next consumptive choice, right? That's how the economic worldview wins. 
It's easy at the next choice to say, are the benefits greater than the cost? Yes, do it. How about this one? Are the benefits greater than the cost? Yes, do it. You, you follow my logic here? <laughs> benefits, cost, benefits, cost, but all at the margin. But this results in what Alfred Kahn, an economist who worked for the Carter administration from, from Cornell, called the tyranny of small decisions. When you add up all those individual decisions over time, you result in an outcome that the individual decision makers never would have voted for. And that's the problem, market society, right? If you organize your society by market votes, by individual votes, by incremental decisions, then you get climate change, biodiversity loss, failing schools, congested highways, gun violence. You name your social ill, your social problem, your ecological collapse, and it's built on an individual decision-making system. Yeah. Would that be another way of saying the tragedy of the commons? It is, it is, it is, and it isn't. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's a little, the commons problems are a little bit different. It sounds like exactly the same thing. Each person putting their sheep out on the commons, <laughs> and then the commons gets destroyed because there's more value to each individual sheep owner than it is th than the commons. Yeah. It's a kind of, it's a kind of puzzle of the, the, by, by prioritizing individual choice, you lose choice. So what um, Alfred Kahn was writing in 1966, he was at Cornell in Ithaca, New York, and Ithaca, New York was about to shut down its, its train connection from Ithaca to New York City. And he was lamenting on this. He was like, why are you shutting down the train? And the train, private train company was like, well, because it's not paying. <laughs> not supporting itself. People are voting with their dollars and they're saying, no, right? We don't need to train. But then that choice is gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> who's, who's, who, without voting with your, when you're voting for your dollars, you're voting to say, we don't want this train anymore. But if you voted in the public, you might say, hey, we'll support the train. We'll pay our fair share. We'll be taxed. We'll subsidize it. We'll keep this option, right? So you lose options. Um, I was fooling with my, this just came to mind, I was fooling with my students when I came into, came into class one morning and I said, did you all hear the new proposal? They're going to develop this side of Mount Mansfield, the Burlington side, into a new ski resort, right? 100 new trails, snow making, the lights, the full, full kit and caboodle, what do you think? And they were all like, that's awful, that's terrible, we don't, we don't want that. We, that. we don't want another big, huge, monstrous ski resort on the... West, western slopes of Mount Mansfield for this reason, that reason, that reason, right? And then I said, okay, once it's built, will you ski there? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So it's a different decision, right? Between a market decision and a democratic decision. And that's key. And the last illusion is the illusion of growth, which is a big one to take on, that we take on squarely in ecological economics, right? Um, how long are we going to live under the illusion of growing a finite system, uh, growing a system within a finite system, growing an economy within a fixed earth system, right? The whole sort of brilliance of ecological economics is quite simple. When we teach economics, we usually have firms and households and they trade goods and services and money with one another and around, around, around the thing goes, right? And it can go on and on and on and on and on forever and ever and ever because no, it's not embedded inside of anything. In fact, the environment is inside the economy of how we teach economics. There's a coal sector, there's an oil sector, there's a forestry sector, there's a farming sector. And these are sectors of the economy. But the economy is embedded in the environment, right? And as the economy grows, there are benefits to that growth and there are costs. When we teach macroeconomics, <laughs> we don't teach the opportunity cost of growth. All growth is good. All GDP is good. All expenditures are benefits. None are costs. So what we get is into a situation now where my colleague Herman Daly calls uneconomic growth. Go back to marginal benefits. Like, use the language of economists. Marginal benefits, marginal cost. If the next unit of growth has more cost and benefits, then we should stop growing. Why don't we? Because we don't count the costs and we concentrate the benefits, right? 
We spread the costs out on the future. We spread the costs out on all of those non-voting public, people who aren't voting with their dollars, right? And we concentrate the benefits to the folks who have the purchasing power. So on, we're in an era, especially in Western countries, of uneconomic growth, right? If you sort of do the math and you start to do the calculus of this, and this is some of the work we've done in the state of Vermont with this genuine progress indicator, right? Play by the rules of economists, play by the rules of the state house, take the gross state product, gross the GDP of Vermont, and then start asking you, is this asking the question, is this a benefit or is it a cost, right? When we spend money to clean up a river, when we spend money to rebuild a, a home or a neighborhood after a flood, or when we spend money in defense of environmental collapse, we shouldn't count that as a benefit, right? We should count it at least as a regrettable expense, as a regrettable cost. And then think of all the sort of transactions in our lives that aren't counted in the marketplace. Household work, elder care, family care, right? We are encouraged as economic citizens to get our kids into daycare, to put our, our parents into to elder care, right? And to get back to work. <laughs> and, and we don't recognize that trade-off in our basic bookkeeping, right? All, there's, I, the examples are, they go on and on and on. But there's this illusion of growth, this illusion of endless growth and we're in a situation right now where we have to start asking, at least, we have to ask three questions. Who is the growth for? What purpose is the growth for? And for how long? That's a 21st century set of questions, right? The 18th century questions were, how efficient is the growth? Now we have to say, how big is the economy relative to the environment, the scale of the system? and how equitable is the growth, right? That's where we are in the 21st century. That's not reflected in our textbooks, in our courses, and in our study of economics. So I argue we need a new story. And in this new story, I knock the human off the top of the ladder of nature and embed us with the rest of life, right? So I take on my Roman Catholic roots as well. Uh, I argue we need a new economics. And ultimately, that would help us create a new economy. So Paul Samuelson, any of you who've studied economics might have had Paul Samuelson as the textbook. Uh, Harvard economist, uh, no, second Nobel Prize winner in economics. He said, change happens in economics one funeral at a time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little more impatient than that, right? Uh, as we sort of wait for generations of folks like me who were sort of drank the Kool-Aid in the 80s, or the next generation who drank the Kool-Aid again in the 90s, and the next generation who drank the Kool-Aid again in the 2010s. Like economics is not losing ground as a dominant thought system in our education system. So Paul Samuelson, change happens in economics one funeral at a time. I think we can hurry up and reclaim our future from the fairy tale of economics. We have to one, lean into the plurality of values, Right? Recognize that economic value is a small slice of value and what's valuable, mm -hmm. right? Really cool experiment, daycare system. Parents were late picking up their kids. So the daycare decided, we're gonna start charging for you to be late mm -hmm. per minute. Mm -hmm. What happened, the problem got better or worse? Better quick. Got worse. No. Got worse, markedly worse, right? Because now, before I'm late, I'm sorry, it was part of my social obligation not to be late, right? My social contract. I'm sorry, I'm wasting your time, you're trying to get home, have dinner. Now I'm late, I pay for it. Wow. wow. Right? So there's a whole literature on how economic values crowd out <laughs> other dimensions of who we are as humans, right? So the plurality of values is really important, not to reduce everything to economic values. Again, economics is an expression of values and it's an expression of power. Okay, another, another thing I'm, I'm often confronted with when I talk about ecological economics or economics and all its failings and how it's a model and rational actor and blah, 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 blah. Someone usually, a trained economist usually quotes George Box, this British statistician. And George said, all models are wrong, some are useful. 
Okay, which I agree, right? All, it's a model. <laughs> All models are wrong, some are useful. But I started learning to ask useful for whom? <laughs> The economics model, the mainstream model, the orthodox model is wrong. It's useful, and it's useful for some pretty powerful people. Right? We have to recognize that. Number two is I've mentioned to re reclaim our future, we need to embed the individual and create a more relational economics. Right? And our, our young people get this. They, they understand this. Right? They're uncomfortable with their economics classes being taught about this isolation and this rationality and this sort of superhuman computer kind of thing that's lacking emotion, lacking care, lacking relationships, which defines who the individual is, right? So that's like, that's an easy lift for us. We need to reclaim our future through thinking about institutions and institutional design and that, yeah, markets do great things, right? But markets and everywhere and always are regulated for a purpose. Whose purpose and for what purpose, right? So we need markets. We need well-regulated markets and we need non-market institutions where markets just don't do the job, right? Where we need to get together in committees and meetings and make decisions as democracies. I'm sorry, we can't just vote with our dollars or we're gonna fall into the tyranny of small decisions. Uh, David Colander, a, a retired professor from Middlebury College, often talked about the invisible hand, right? Which is this metaphor for the market system, but also the invisible foot, <laughs> our, regulation, our regulatory systems, right? And the invisible handshakes, our social cultural norms. And we can't use the hand to crowd out the foot and the handshake. It's really a balancing act between those three forces, right? Our social cultural norms, our, our, our regulations, and market forces. Um, you know, institutional design to me screams for comprehensive planning, long-term planning, bioregional planning, building democratic systems that shape the economy. And that's where, where we've lost ground big time with the neoliberal turn since the mid-1970s. And then lastly, um, we need to get about building a there's lots of names for it, post-industrial, post-growth, um, post-capitalism, post, there's lots of posts, <laughs> but certainly a post-growth economy, right? We've built an economy that fundamentally depends on growth for survival. And when the economy starts growing, lots of people are hurt and usually the most vulnerable, right? <clears throat> this is craziness <laughs> that you would build a system that depends on infinite economic growth to survive, right? that you would somehow imagine that stability comes from exponential growth <laughs> when there's no other system out there where that's the case, right? Um, so in building a post-growth economy, in, in orchestrating a just transition to a right-sized economy where we all benefit from the economic system, where we all live well but within our means, right? That's the balancing act of a new economics. This to me looks like a race to the middle. We got plenty of overworked, miserable people and plenty of underworked, miserable people, right? So we can imagine time use that races to the middle, right? And realize that paternity and maternity leave is about quality of life for all of our citizens, right? Realize that we have underemployed and overemployed, right? And rebalancing our work-life balance and the work-leisure balance. The early classical economists, like predating the orthodoxy of neoclassical economics, they talked about a coming age, a steady state economy, right? When the economic system would stop growing, it would reach a stationary state, and when people would have more time, not less with family, more time, not less with community, more time, not less with leisure. And we've done just the opposite, right? We've done just the opposite. We need to rethink ownership. There's a whole private to public spectrum, right? Vermont can be really proud of, of the growth in employee owned companies, right? What's the next phase of that? Community owned companies, right? We need to relocalize. We need to decentralize, right? We need all of these things that are going to require taking back power and building economies as an expression of a democracy's values 
not an expression of the capitalist values. Um, and ultimately, we're not going to have isolated communities disconnected from one another. We're going to build peace and prosperity through uncoerced exchange with one another, right? Not through exploitation and continued colonialism of the earth and its people. So that was a lot to take in on a <laughs> Thursday. Is it Thursday? Thursday evening. And I really look forward to your questions. Thanks. Yes. Um, what I find disturbing is ecological economics. Uh, I see all these entrepreneurial businesses producing a lot of stuff that um, is not biodegradable or recyclable, and we keep accumulating unsustainable and toxic materials that, you know, we should be going in totally the opposite direction. And I don't get the impression that that is the case whatsoever. Yeah, so the question was around all, all of the things that we produce that require toxics, that make toxics, that bring us in the opposite direction. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think the, the first place to start in, in the post-growth, or dare I say degrowth phase that we should be moving into, is to say, these are the things that are necessities. <laughs> And these are the things that don't provide joy, don't provide love, don't provide, they provide luxuries maybe to some or conveniences, but they harm the rest of us through well, toxics, through well, pollution. Well, educating through. the people when you're done using this stuff, it's going to go into a landfill, which is going to run into a river. I mean, people sure. need to be taken to a higher level of consciousness. Well, it's the old reduce, reuse, mm -hmm. recycle adage, right? We just jump right to recycle mm -hmm. without first walking through reduce, <laughs> reuse. Mm -hmm then the last resort is recycle. Well, even recycling isn't necessarily um, no, that's not legitimate. No. Yeah. It, 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 so everything, what the economy does is it takes matter and energy in and puts waste out. That's, that's what any ecosystem does, right? In physics terms, it takes low entropy matter energy, useful stuff, and makes high entropy matter energy waste. Disuseful stuff, right? We can recycle, but recycling always is a trade-off. It's always gonna require energy, it's always gonna require more materials, it's always gonna require that energetic feedback to move back up the entropy ladder to, from a, a state of disorganization to back to a state of organization. So there's always gonna be a trade-off. So we gotta, we gotta reduce, we gotta reuse, and the last resort should be recycle, which is usually the first resort. Yes. Okay, so my question is something that I've always wondered. Clearly, the United States, if you build half a project, leave it there, it'll sit there forever. No one's going to ask you to clean it up. You, you know, you dig the ground, there's a tremendous industrial site, doesn't get finished. It's just going to sit there forever because no one's going to clean it up unless somebody else buys it and decides they want to reuse it. Like the company that built it is never going to be ever going to have any responsibility to clean it up. And that seems to be the case for everything in this country. What are other countries that don't have the level of, like, you can do whatever the hell you want with the land here, like Norway or Denmark or Iceland, countries that care more about their physical land, do they have requirements that when people build something that they are responsible for the land the, after it gets built, like if the thing starts falling down, they're responsible for cleaning up that property or anything. So that, it seems here, it's amazing to me that any company can walk away from any property right. that they've defiled and never have any responsibility for it. Yeah, well, the United States is quite unique in that respect. Yeah, that's what I saw. Um, and, and again, it, it dates back to an investment in law and economics centers, right, at universities where law was merged with economics to give rights to business owners, mm -hmm. right? To give rights to the entrepreneur and to design our legal systems to hold that right and hold them harmless from things like risk or accidents or liability, right? So this would be research for a whole nother book <laughs> to talk about that kind of blurring of, of economic ideology in our legal system. But um, certainly um, and my colleagues who do ecological economics in Europe are part of, of different legal systems, different legal traditions, 
are, are, we're starting to see more and more laws that are producer responsibility oriented, right? In Europe. In Europe, yeah, yeah not here, Europe. not here. I mean, here, it, I mean, I suppose the nuclear power industry was forced to do this through taxing itself for decommissioning. How's that playing out here? You all know better than me. Very slowly. Slowly. <laughs> very slowly. Superfund is that kind of idea, right? As well, like paying to a fund, but it's all through market mechanisms. It's all through economic mechanisms, right? It's not done through legal. You will get sued and go to jail if you break the law. <laughs> it's you will get fined and then go on and do your next dirty deed, right? So there's a whole literature on the economics of regulation where economists <laughs> build models about the probability of being caught and fined and can show profit maximizing behavior of breaking the law, right? So again, this is the economic mindset that I'm taking on. Um, but you, you all are giving examples kind of down in the weeds of like particular applications, which is important. Yeah, Alex. Yeah, so I'm not an economist and never took an econo economics course, but uh, it seems that mainstream economists understand the principle of Ponzi schemes, mm. you know, as personified by Bernie Madoff and <laughs> others. But I've never understood why they don't recognize that that economic religion or the growth, the religion of growth, isn't seen as a similar Ponzi sure. scheme. Mm. Well, there, there's an ideological bent to economists that we share with engineers, <laughs> that we share with technologists, that we share with folks like Elon Musk, <laughs> that we don't live in a constrained world, or that constraints are relative, <clears throat> not absolute. If a constraint is relative, that means when you hit a wall, when you hit a limit, you just use innovation and smartness to get around it and do something different or find a new material, find a new invention, right? There's no sense of absolute constraints in how we teach economics. Everything's relative. And, and, and relative constraints means that everything has a price and everything has a price signal. So economists say when things get scarce, prices go up and then you do less of it, right? But what if that system has collapsed? What if the system has fallen apart? What if what if your next marginal step hit an ecological threshold that you didn't anticipate? So this is where economics is completely disconnected from our modern science, our, our understanding of complexity, our understanding of interdependent systems, our understanding of thresholds, right? Because if your whole orientation is relative, this choice relative to this choice, next, this next decision relative to this next decision, right? then you're not seeing the big picture. So economists in general don't think about the big picture. They live in a world that Herman Daly called an empty world, which is when economics was designed, right? When the, the, the size of the human system was relatively small compared to the sustaining and containing ecosystem. I would argue that all the evidence points now that we live in a full world, and when I say full, I mean full of the human presence, right? So if you're writing a set of rules designed for a system that has 500 million people versus a system that has north of 8 billion people, <laughs> if you're designing a set of rules where we had regional economies and regional um, exploitations and collapses, but there was always more resource over the next horizon, right? Then you need to design a system based on growth, exploitation, colonialism, right? But when you get to the boundaries of your island, Earth okay. Island, <laughs> you've got the technologists who are saying, okay, now we go to Mars. Now we exploit the universe. Now we mine asteroids and bring the material back here, right? That's the economics mindset, right? That will never be limited because of the power of human ingenuity. So it, it does come down to a religious view, right? Do you believe in the power of humans to always and everywhere escape failure <laughs> or do we hit walls all the time and the wealthy amongst us just don't recognize that I, I, I a lot of my work in the past has been in places like Haiti and East Africa uh, sub-Saharan Africa in general and look <laughs> water limits soil limits air limits uh, food limits 
most of the rest of the world have hit limits a long time ago, right? And the only way they escape limits is through further dependence on trade, which means further dependence on places like us. How long can that last? Uh, yes, and then yes, and then yes. Go ahead. That's what you just said called to mind the, the very important book, The Limits to Growth. Yes. Which, which uh, had a profound impact, but not on enough people. It, but what Alex, to answer or to address what Alex just said about the religion of growth, it, it reminded me of a talk I once heard by a theologian, I'm blanking on his name, he had a southern accent, but he quoted Herman Bailey as saying, and the, the guy who was delivering the talk was a theologian, he said, it's, in theology, the, the academic discipline of theology, you get a PhD, that you can question the existence of God and still be a respected voice <laughs> in the community yeah. or, or uh, uh, in that academic field. You can question the existence of God and still not be an outlier. But then he quoted Herman Daly by saying, but as an economist, if you question the existence of growth, mm -hmm. you're marginalized. Right. And now this talk was back in the 80s, I think, when Daly was writing, but right. I think it's one of the reasons I'm not gonna read your book, because, <laughs> <laughs> because it's all been said. Yeah. That, that, that Daly, Daly ran it down in terms of uh, ecological economics, and he was marginalized and, and not taken seriously by the, by the discipline and by his by fellow academics and, and policy makers. And I don't see any reason with the growth in inequality in the last 30 years, why your book is gonna make the slightest bit of difference either. <laughs> Aww. It's okay. That's me. That's me. I can take it, I can take it, it's okay. Um, you can take it, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I had many of those moments while writing this book. I'm like, oh, geez. Another white male economist, isn't that unique? <laughs> <laughs> well, it has a lot to do with it. Okay. And um, yeah, no, I, 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 no, I don't think this book is any watershed moment where all of a sudden everyone's going to wake up, but it's kind of one, one more brick in the edifice, right? One, one more arrow in the, in the myth, uh -huh. one more. And it's, and it's my story. It's a personal story. So I, I don't write it as a, as a kind of academic treatise. I write it as my own personal story of coming to terms with these things. So it's meant to speak to my generation. Um, and I think each new generation needs to be, my, my students don't know who Herman Daly is. I have to introduce it, right. them to you do, but they don't. Right. So each new generation has to be reminded, right? Because it's sort of like, it, you know, folks our age and older say, well, limits to growth, 1972, <laughs> that was bullshit. Look, we're still fine. No, we're not, <laughs> right? And if you take their data and their world model and model it against Today's data, it's like dead on, right? It's still, we're still not quite at the peaks of what they were predicting. And, and it's again, a sort of, it's a, it's a story, it's a narrative, it's a who does growth benefit, right? What's the purpose of growth and for how long, right? That's the questions we have to keep asking over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, a couple of things. Um, I wanted you to just comment on how possible it is even for one nation to really control its economy in a global mm. economic setting. And if you had any knowledge of, for instance, what China is doing or what the philosophies of economics are in China, I would be interested mm. in in hearing that um, mm. people often say that we need to keep growing because the population keeps growing. Right. So I would also like you to comment on um, population growth. <laughs> and finally, any kind of leaks in the system here, like where's it going? Where do you see rays of hope? Yeah. If Econ 101 is still the law of the mm -hmm. land in our elite institutions, where do you see progress being made? How can we help? Yeah, and that's in part answer to your question. There, there are windows, there are cracks. There are, there's actually cracks within the sort of fortress of economics as economists. Mm -hmm. Economists have always had physics envy, right? They've always wanted to be seen as real scientists. <laughs> and so um, when, as economists have worked more with 
behavioral sciences, with the neural sciences, um, and to sort of dismantle and upend these fictional views of, of the human animal, they themselves are writing and publishing the, the new model. It just hasn't creeped into the Econ 101 books yet, right? That huge market that influences so many young minds every year. Um, so uh, you had multiple layers to your question there. I'm trying to... National versus international. Yeah, I mean, this, this is the challenge, right? And this is the, the challenge that we all face. Like, how do you change the system while you're in the system, right? How do you jump off the treadmill while you're running as fast as you can to keep up, right? Um, can one country do it? Can I find more hope at community scales, right? Mm -hmm. One of our partners is the Next Systems Project, a, a, a project hatched by Gus, Gus Speth and Gar Operovitz. That's really systematically going around and, and I think stating the obvious. The next system is all around us, mm -hmm. right? It's just not scaled up or out yet, right? You go to a farmer's market and you see elements of the next system. You see community supported <laughs> agriculture, you see elements of the next system. You see new ownership models in, within business. You see elements of an next system. You talk to our colleagues in VBSR, Vermont Business for Social Responsibility, you see elements of an next system, right? It's just not scaled up or out yet. So always and everywhere, new ideas come in, come in waves in unexpected times, usually in response to crisis, usually in response to collapse, right? So we're building a kind of post-growth world. I choose to do it by design and then instead of by disaster, right? So if we're, gonna, if we're gonna hit limits, we can either run into those limits by design or by disaster. And so for example, there's a huge scholarship on post-growth and, and degrowth that is really starting to influence policy circles in Europe, right? Uh, I think economics has too much of a stranglehold on, on the American ideology, right? And I think uh, American centrism is, is still alive and well and a big problem. And I think we're going to go through a lot of um, harm and, and hurt <laughs> to sort of dethrone the American hegemony. Um, but where I see hope yeah, are colleagues in Latin America, mm -hmm. colleagues in South America, coll colleagues in, in, in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, colleagues who are starting to wake up to the idea that, shit, we don't want what you're selling, <laughs> right? There's all this, there's this, there's this ideology of, well, you know, once, once the rest of the world catches up and once we're all developed, then we can handle climate change, right? People are starting to say, well, okay, if, if we grow like you and we look more like you and we're a consumer society like you, we become a market society like you, then do we also get obesity, suicide, mental health, problems do we also do we get uh defense i mean the biggest part of our economy is defense right like if you're really going to replicate the american experience <laughs> a lot of people are waking up and, and and so we've tried to sort of create these ties through what's called the washington consensus the u.s treasury the world bank and the international monetary fund to sort of sell the american story worldwide ever since the 1950s that's, that's breaking down. That's breaking down big time. That's why there are chinks in the armor and openings for a new book or a new voice, right? <laughs> a new something. I, yeah, I recognize that I'm just one of many voices that's been crying to the wind. But um, this, is a, this is about a paradigm shift, right? It's about Can you that, say where it's breaking down? Well, uh, uh, so my examples are, are in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Southeast Asia, it's breaking down in communities, right? It's breaking down in places like Brattleboro, where people are trying to sort of define a local economy, right? Mm -hmm. It's breaking down where everyone recognizes that your economy is like a leaky bucket, right? And there's two strategies to keep a leaky bucket full. <laughs> One is grow, keep pouring water in as fast as you can. So you do that by giving tax breaks, tax cuts, depend on the outside world. Come to Vermont, we'll subsidize you. We gotta grow our populations, we're depopulizing, right? All the governor nonsense about grow, 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 grow. Every governor, not just ours. Or we can plug leaks in our bucket. <laughs> For example, energy conservation is a wonderful leak to plug, right? How many of you wake up every morning and say, I can't wait to pay my energy bill. I can't wait to fill up my car with gasoline, right? 
Simple things like home weatherization, which we're way behind on our state targets, keeps, has the potential <laughs> to keep money in our economy instead of leak out to the energy sector, right? We're not a fossil fuel state, right? Local, local ag, right? Farm to plate. That's another leaky bucket, a, a way to plug the leak, right? To keep income circulating, to create true wealth. Commonwealth, right? Building boards and commissions and ownership of our commonwealth through citizenship, not through vote with your dollars, right? So um, land trusts and land conservation is another thing to do to take back our economy, take back the commons from the private hands, right? The thing is, when you think about it, there are so many things that to do, but there are so many things that are already being done. <laughs> we don't have to buy the story of the economic worldview that the only way to survive in this world is to compete, grow, <laughs> and exploit. I lost track. There was a hand over here. Yes. Hey, John. Thanks yeah. for work. I'm interested in hearing more examples of practical policy changes that will build on the momentum of some of the examples you've given, and also just your thoughts. You know, I work in the food and ag sector. I mean, one thing that just strikes me is people make all these bad decisions with their money, partly, mostly because it's so opaque. You really don't know what you're sure, buying or sure. how that food was produced or where it came from or any of the things that even from an individual globule perspective, <laughs> uh, right. people would easily, you know, align with their personal well-being. Some of that, some of that is about, is this food safe? And, but I think, again, that whole compassion and caring for, you know, monetizing that in your brain or like that, I don't, don't want to save a dollar on that hamburger if it's sure, sure. doing this to people or the environment. So yeah, how do we, how I mean, do we do both those things, you know, have some practical policies to start with, but also do more to pull back the curtain on the information we lack to make better decisions economically. Well, I mean, some of it is, I mean, like econo economists preach against monopolies, but then they go and testify for monopolies. I don't get it, right? Monopoly power is, is the loss of choice and a loss of consumer agency, right? Um, Economists preach about perfect information, that a well-functioning market has perfect information. The consumer knows everything and the producer knows everything. That's BS, right? We have asymmetric information. Uh, Joseph Stiglitz won a Nobel Prize for saying that, right? God, I wish I had said that. We have asymmetric information, right? The producer knows more than the consumer, right? So you need con consumer protection laws, right? You need labeling laws, right? All of these are things are, in fact, are consistent with a free market, right? But the market rules now are written by an elite class. The market rules are written by the capital owners. The market rules are written by increasingly not the 1%, but the 0.001%. If I can channel Bernie here for a second, right? So this is what I mean. The e economics and economy are a reflection of, of society's values and power, right? So this is, and so there's, there's thousands of examples about how to take back, take back power. Um, you know, different ownership models for companies, um, different models for com common asset trusts, um, different ag agricultural models in, in, in your world, right? Uh, a cooperative models. I mean, we, we have long traditions and long experience of, of food cooperatives, energy cooperatives. Um, you know, we're, we're launching a new project at the University of Vermont on what would energy shed design look like? So we've gone, we've learned a lot around watersheds and watershed health. We've talked a lot about food sheds and relocalizing our food system. What would the similar thing look like for energy sheds? Because if we're going to remove to renewables, <laughs> it means that Vermonters are going to get more of the benefits of our energy system, but also the costs. So we have to start thinking about when you go from a global energy system, right, where the energy sheds the planet and we get the benefits of cheap gas and other people pay the costs, right? If we're going to move to a renewable energy future, A, we should do it at a much, 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 much smaller scale. So it's like the re re reduce, reuse, recycle thing, right? Switch to renewables as the last resort, right? After you've reduced, after you've weatherized, after you've employed efficiency, you've got it to a manageable scale, and then the rest is what we need to use, in our case, electricity for. 
I'm blabbering on here, but but man, I, I could. There's so many. There's so many. Yeah, the Next Systems Project is a great resource here because so many of the things that I'm drawn to are so not technical fixes, right? We've got we've got lots of great people out there thinking about technical fixes. What we need to orchestrate this is the socio-technical transformation, right? So much, so many of our barriers to adoption of the next thing aren't technical; they're social, right? And so much of, of our lack of product progress is not because there's not money, there's not wealth, there's plenty. <laughs> it's lack of imagination, right? It's, it's, and it's this sort of dualistic mindset of it's either capitalism or socialism and there's nothing in between. That's just nonsense. There's this whole spectrum, a continuum in between of public control, public benefit. Private control, public benefit, right? Don't lose the public benefit piece. Have time for one more question. One more question. Yes. Um, <clears throat> it's not really a question, but about 10 years ago, I joined Twin Oaks Intentional Community. Um, I put my kids in, I did not want to put my kids in a regular school because I, at an early age, found the competition where the smart kids are in one corner. This is the 50s and 60s. And it was so hurtful. I did not want to put my kids in regular school where competition ruled the whole thing. So it Twin Oaks, that, that was the same deal. It's sustainable, everybody works for $80 a month. And on some level, given there were a lot of people who couldn't really live in the regular world, they were okay at Twin Oaks. Twin Oaks is still functioning, it started in the 70s. Uh, I saw a film there, I went there for the same reason. Competition never made sense to me. It, scared me, I don't function like that. People have always felt that way. There's always been counterculture, communes, and to some extent they, because you're not happy when you're stepping on somebody else. The bottom line is capitalism is simply wrong. It should be illegal to exploit other people. Mm -hmm. And that's what our political system is. I guess what I'm trying to say is, <clears throat> We can all choose to live in an alternative system based on mutually caring for each other first and foremost. If you're working in a job where you're destroying the environment and you're torturing other people, get out of that job and do a job where you're helping people. I then went on to work in a psych hospital and there were patients there, sorry to call them people, but they were very, they suffered a great deal. They were turned into a number, given a diagnosis. Many never left, some came back. Anyway, they would fight to have a work that was needed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was tragic to see people who had nothing, wanting above all to do something that was needed, like wiping <clears throat> the tables down. That was one of the things I will never forget. One of the worst things you can do is make a human being useless. That's what our mental health system does to people. Mm -hmm. That's what our culture does to people. If you're not doing it, you're not, you're useless. <laughs> anyway, I, I just Thank you for think. That. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, you're, it's a lot of wisdom in what you're saying that I think is applicable to the system that we're in. When we feel like a number, when we're treated like a number, right? We get consequences of, of people disconnecting from their democratic systems, right? When you feel like you're exploited, when you feel like you're not worth the wage that you get, and you're, I mean, we found this coming out of the, of, uh, the COVID, COVID epidemic, right? We're, you know, the, the two bookmarks, the two sort of beginning and ending of this book at the, towards the later chapters is the Great Recession, and now we're in the, what do they call it, the Great Resignation, thank you, resignation, right? People are, are just sort of like, this is a bullshit job. Like, it's not help, helping me, it's not helping the world, right? So there's, there's, there's a lot of new work coming out on the phenomena of bullshit jobs, right? Mm -hmm. And how we've designed a system just to kind of keep things moving faster and faster, right? Mm -hmm. And um, if you've built a system that depends on growing by selling stuff to people to 
we don't need it. <laughs> I mean, what have we done? And I, I think there's a lot of analogies to the mental health system as well. So I, I appreciate that. Um, well, look, thank, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. And yeah. Whether, whether or not you buy my book, like this gentleman here, um, there are some out on the back. It's a, it's a nonprofit a book publisher, Island Press. They do, check them out. They do fabulous work and they've been doing it for a long time. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much.